ដោយបាទទៅប្រសិទ្ធគឺអ៊ុសសាត្រប្រញ្ញាក៏បានភាយាមធ្វើឲ្យលោកស្រីចក្រមជឿជាក់ថាបីអាប៊ីត្រេល
ដោយគោលនយោបាយទាំងអស់របស់ប្រព័ន្ធកុំមិនីកម្ពុជាផងដែរគោលនយោបាយទាំងនេះពាក់ព័ន្ធនឹងការលើកស្ទុយកម្រ
ដែលជាទូទៅគេប្រើដើម្បីពិពណ៌នេះអំពីការបង្កើតឬក៏សាងវិញមួយដែលគ្មានអ្វីដែលនៅឡើយ for example, I can say that my salary is expressed with my blood and sweat. This does not mean, however, that I work under inhuman conditions. The same thing can be said about the phrase hot battlefields, which is a metaphor often used to describe national reconstruction under the DK. As my colleague, Mr. Savannah, discussed, and unlike what the co-prosecutors argued in paragraph 1,135 of their brief, this obviously does not mean that people are exposed to lethal danger and are expected to it's a policy matter. Now the co-prosecutors also misinterpret the CPK's behaviour. And for instance, they highlight the fact and the fact that senior constantly encourage and what they say is that all this shows that and In fact, this interpretation blatantly disregards both Cambodian and Asian cultures. As you know, these cultures place great value on being hardworking, resilient, and capable of overcoming great difficulties. It's these qualities and the power and wisdom of the people that the CPK took pride in, not the temporary hardship that the people had to endure. And if I can give you an analogy or two, the co-prosecutor's interpretation is as absurd as saying that military medals are awarded to praise the brutality of war instead of the heroic contribution of soldiers. It's as ridiculous as saying, for example, that Cambodian parents who tell their children to study hard do so because they have the criminal intent to abuse those children. Whether consciously or subconsciously, it seems that the prosecutor's misinterpretation of events owes to a Western liberal democratic mentality. As I'm sure you know, Mr. President, this mentality is often more condescending towards Asian countries. Another example of this mentality is the co-prosecutor's argument that it could not have been possible for the trapping of the murder construction to be completed so quickly and with so few resources had there not been threats and violence to force people to work. And we'll find this argument in paragraph 1133 of the brief. Your Honours, this particular argument is both Illogical and cultural. It presumes that Cambodian people could not possibly have been patriotic enough to willingly unite to build their country. We simply disagree. Like one witness testified on the first day of the exam. Despite difficulties, many people were in fact proud. Now, I offer these examples to define the parameters of our debate and to highlight, once again, the importance of interpreting evidence in historical and cultural contexts, not in a vacuum. With that said, I'll now move on to the discussion of the four cross-cutting themes of the evidence, beginning with the authorities' direction to the four sides. Beginning with
Now, Your Honours, as you'll recall, look, look, the trampled properties, the first January dam, and the trapping of mud were under the authority of the Public Works and Agriculture Departments. Kampong Chenang Airfield, on the other hand, was under exclusive military command. And therefore, what's clear is that none of the four sides were under the authority of Nung Chia, who was in charge, as you know, of party education and training. Moreover, despite being under the overall responsibility of a zone or division, the four sides were not directly supervised by the zone or division level authority. Instead, it was the lowest level authority, like unit chiefs, ពលរដ្ឋធានកងឬគណៈបញ្ជាការគឺជាអ្នកទទួលក៏ត្រូវចំពោះប្រតិបត្តិការ and yet, Your Honours, despite all this, the co-prosecutors still claim that there was a perfect chain of command from the national level down to the lowest unit level, and that authorities from each level acted perfectly in compliance with instructions and policies from the top without deviation. And the co-prosecutor's basis for this unconvincing argument, frankly, is general evidence that each level of authority was in contact with its adjacent levels and that they all attended the party training. However, the reality is that apart from a handful of telegrams or minutes of speech, there is no evidence on a specific content of any communication between various levels of And without knowing that content, the mere fact that they communicate with each other is far from sufficient. It cannot prove beyond reasonable doubt that policies and instructions were always passed on fully and accurately, and then in compliance with the authority. And in fact, the variation of conditions between different units shows that it was not the case. The co-prosecutors also argue that senior CPP leaders, including Nguyen Chia, knew of alleged incompetence and crimes at the forefront. Both because there was this chain of command between the authorities and because they were the same. However, again, without evidence on the content of the communication, the mere fact that they communicate with each other is far from sufficient. And that is why the content of the communication is impossible to assess the actual knowledge passed on. In the handful of minutes and minutes that we have available in evidence. There are neither details such as specific working hours or personal work quarters, nor is there information like people being punished for failing to fulfill work plans. Zone level work sometimes vaguely mentioned that there were problems with living standards. However, instead of offering specifics, those reports simply state that measures were taken to solve them, or that the situation was improving. Now, Mr. President, last week, the co-prosecutors quoted documents which reported problems. But what they deliberately omitted mentioning was that in those documents, it's also clear that the authorities were trying to solve the problems. For instance, they mentioned a September 1975 document which said that people were working hard 15 hours a day. And you can look into this further at the exhibit E3-781. 
However, what they failed to mention is that that document expressed concerns over this problem. As a result, it emphasized that machinery must be developed to reduce manual labor. And moreover, in documents subsequent to this one, the CPK repeatedly emphasized they stressed that people should not work long hours without sufficient rest. And I've mentioned this earlier in the first part of my presentation. In addition, evidence also shows that lower-level authorities often withheld information from their superiors, and the co-prosecutors are also aware of this. In paragraph 758 of their brief, they mentioned that a Trump cop cadre reported malnutrition and shortage of medicine to the district authorities, but was apparently scolded for doing so. The district authorities who allegedly scolded him obviously would not pass this kind of information on to their superiors. Mr. President, Your Honours, with all these factors combined, it's clear that senior CPK leaders did not retain sufficient knowledge of the conditions through the communication system. And as you recall, the other way they tried to prove this allegation was through site visits. But it's also unlikely that the leaders retained enough knowledge through those site visits. The sites were huge. And there were a large, large number of people. This made it obviously impossible for the leaders to see everything. And moreover, we have evidence that many units instructed their members to work more actively than the leaders. As a result, what they could see was that people were relatively good physical condition, and also that they were working in high morale. Furthermore, the perfect the perfect control and communication system argued by the co-prosecutors does not exist in even the most organized countries. What they're describing is essentially just a state administrative structure. Now, Mr. President, if this is sufficient to make Nunchia criminally responsible for the actions of the lowest level DK authorities, then by analogy, any senior state leaders can be criminally responsible for any crimes committed by the lowest officials of their country. It's clearly ridiculous. That concludes what we were going to tell you on that theme, and so I'll move on to the next theme we'll discuss, which is the purpose and the function of the force itself. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the establishment of cooperatives and the construction of water projects and defensive facilities were not to enslave the population. They were necessary for national reconstruction and defense, which ultimately aimed at improving people's lives. And let's take Kampong Chnang Airfield, for example. The closing order alleges that it was a tempering site to punish soldiers who were considered as so-called bad elements by making them work as slaves under the Indian conditions. Mr. President, this is completely unsubstantiated. Compared to its neighbors, Cambodia did not have a strong air force, and this put it at a distinct disadvantage in its border clashes with Thailand and Vietnam. That was why the CPK decided in early 1970s to build a military airfield in Kampong Chnang to better defend the country. The need for the airfield to be put in use became increasingly urgent. As the armed conflict between Cambodia and Vietnam intensified, as you know, however, nothing in the CPK document suggests that it was a site for temporary elements. Soldiers constructing the airfield were not sent there because they were considered so-called bad elements. 
ក្រុមទីកន្លែងពីវេលាដើម្បីឆ្លើយទៅទៅស្ថានភាពពុងរាយនៅតាមគ្រប់ទីកន្លែងពីវេលាដើម្បីឆ្លើយទៅទៅស
ពីចេកទេសនៅក្នុងដែលមិនទីពីចេកទេសនៅក្នុងដែលមិនទីពីចេកទេសនៅក្នុងដែលមិនទីពីចេកទេសនៅក្នុងដែលមិនទីពីច